For a few weeks now, we've been on this subject uh, from our text in 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and the eighth verse. They'll put it on the screen for us. It says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. I just like the sound of that phrase. He's able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Let's pray and release our faith here and in Branson and on the internet. Father, in the name of Jesus, we agree together as touching this right now tonight, asking you for utterance. I'm saying, Lord, speak through me. Let it be beyond me. Let it be you through us. Give us all eyes that see and ears that hear and a heart that receives and a mind that understands exactly what you are saying to us and and the supply of the Spirit to us. We pray and ask for your spirit to move in us and among us and through us and the gifts and manifestations of your spirit to be in operation. And we say, Lord, we'll not be forgetful hearers or hearers only, but what you show us by your grace, we'll do it. We'll put it into practice and be doers of your word. And we know when we do, we will be blessed because you always watch over your word and perform it in the lives of those who do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This text tells us that God is able to make all grace abound toward us. This word abound is an outstanding word. Uh, You really, I think, you almost need more than one English word to describe the Greek word this comes from. And you'll see that. Uh, in different verses and in the different translations. In John 10, uh, it talks about the same idea of abounding. In John 10 and 10, it says, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Who should you blame when things are stolen from you? Who should you blame when things are killed? In your life? Hmm? Destroyed in your life? Isn't it, a, isn't it sad that so many Christians are blaming God? Hmm? God's not our problem. Never has been. He's our answer. And you know what's, what's sadder yet? There's a whole lot of church going people that's really mad at God. They wouldn't just come right out and say it, most of them. And then a lot of people that used to go to church that don't go to church anymore, mad at God. They're they're convinced that God let them down somewhere. They're convinced God didn't come through for them. They let the devil convince them that God, either either he doesn't care or he's not even real or, or all kind of manner of things. And this lie has choked the goodness of God out of their life and they have limited the Holy One of Israel. From doing things for them and on their behalf. And it's not that God is, is mad at them and doesn't want to do anything for them. It's that they got the doors closed and barred. Yeah. Don't you remember the revelation said that the master stands at the door and knocks. Hmm? Well, if you're going to enjoy him and get things from him, what's going to have to happen? Well, why would he be standing at the door and knocking? Because the door is closed. Right? The door is closed. Now this is something that a lot of people have not, either they hadn't heard it or they haven't believed it. People try to preach and teach that, you know, that that's got nothing to do with it. That God just does stuff in people's life or he doesn't do it just when and how he wants and they have nothing to do with it. That is not true. There's all kind of things that God wants to do for people, but they won't invite him in. They won't open the door. They, they, they believe lies. They, they don't believe at all. They got the door shut. But didn't he go on to say, if any man will open the door, I'll come in. Not just come in, but I'll sit down and sup with him. Right? 
fellowship. How many believe you'd get some good and rich things from fellowshipping with the king of kings? But you got to open the door. You got to open the door. So God is not the thief. He's not the killer. He's not the destroyer. There is a devil. There is a destroyer. Hmm? Don't blame God. What the rest of the verse go on to say? But I am come, he said. Jesus said, I'm, he's contrasting, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He's not the one doing the stealing, killing, and destroying. That's the thief doing that. Certainly Jesus is not the thief. The Father's not the thief. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life. And that they might have it more abundantly. This, this word abounding, this word abundance, if you'll look up the words, there's a, I guess there's about seven or so different words that are actually from the same root word. And they all have some of the same meaning. And they mean, let me, let me read the definitions for you. They mean, like you see here, abundance. But let me read the, the definitions from, these are like from vines and Thayer's and Strong's, different definitions, people that studied these languages their whole life. One says it means beyond. One says it means excessive. Another one says uh, enough and more. One says surplusage. Another one says superabundance. And I like that because super, when we hear the word super, we tend, our mind tends to run off on a tangent and think Superman, <laughs> super whatever. But no, super just, super's a word. Yeah. It's not a, a fictitious word. It's a real word that means above and beyond, basically. Mm -hmm. You've you got something that's, uh, that, that's good and then you've got something that's super, super <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Super is uh, beyond the abundance. So basically, it means beyond abundance. Yeah. Hmm? And it's translated, these words are translated that, like, like when the mo loaves and fishes were multiplied. They had 12 baskets over and above. Yeah. These are some of the same ideas. Over and above. That means the thousands of people were satisfied and fed. And, and how many think that was supernatural provision? But that wasn't all that you had. In addition to everybody getting their fill of loaves and fishes, there were 12 baskets left over, surplus. Is this the will of God? Is surplus the will of God? It is. The Amplified says it like this in John 10:10, 10, 10, I came that they may have an enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. So you can see why the Amplified added that because that's what the word literally means. It means not just enough, not just to the brim, more than that. More than that. Can you say amen? amen. Ephesians 3.20, go over there. Ephesians 3.20 talks about the same idea, same concept, got this word abundant in here. And he says, now unto him that is able to do what? Exceeding abundantly above. That's a good description of what we're talking about, isn't it? Yes. Exce not, just, not just what you asked. And not just above what you asked. Not just abundantly above what you asked. But exceedingly. Yeah. Abundantly. Above what you asked or thought. God's able to do that. Isn't that our text that we read? That God was able. In fact, I'll just, I'll just read it again. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. So that you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. And then this one says... Ephesians 3.20, now unto him is able yeah. to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
With these kind of verses and these kind of thoughts, how is it that millions of Christians, and this didn't start last week or 50 years ago, there are whole splinter groups of Christians, I won't call names, that developed back a century ago, two centuries ago, more than that, that decided that Spartan living was godly. Hmm? That, that living with bare minimum was connected to holiness. Uh, it, it remains with the strong today in numerous groups that if you're really going to get close to God, you, you, you can't have stuff and money, especially you couldn't have extra stuff and money. But how does that agree with these verses that we're looking at? How does that agree? We, we, we must discern. Even though it's been around for hundreds of years, that don't mean it's right. Just because somebody had a, a messed up idea 500 years ago, <laughs> it's still messed up is what I was going to say. Right? Isn't it? And we should examine everything. You should examine everything you hear me preach and teach. And anybody else, you should examine it closely with the written word of God. And you should check it against what, you, what kind of witness you have in your own heart. Because if it's the Holy Spirit on me and through me, you've got the very same Holy Spirit, right? right. In you, you and on you. And you're going to recognize that even if it's new to your head, it's going to be familiar to your heart. Right? The anointing teaches you. And that anointing abides in you and me 24-7. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And it happens, we'll come, come back to this I believe later. Not just independently of us. It, it's tied. God being able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. is tied to something going on in us. Can you see this saints? What God is able to do for us. Is tied to something going on in us. The power that's working in us. So. It's not independent of us. Let me say it again. It's tied to something working in us. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. We touched on this in, in previous services. If you weren't with us, let me encourage you that... Uh, to get caught up with us because we can't cover everything every time and, and make progress. Uh, you can get the previous messages, download them off the internet. You can go back to the word supply, get a CD. It won't cost you anything. And it's, uh, how many that were with us would tell them it'd be worth their time to, to get, you, you, you won't get the full measure out of this not having heard the other. But if they go back and hear that and then hear this again, yeah. you could get more than ever. Right? right. I know uh, Jesus said, take heed how you hear. He said both statements, take heed what you hear. He also said, take heed how you hear. For the measure you meet to it, that's how it'll be measured back to you. And uh, I know one of the first times I really saw this is uh, Phyllis and I went out to Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and went to Rhema Bible Training Center, Brother Kenneth Hagin's ministry. And I was, we're, we're going to go one year <laughs> and go back home. And 20 years later, we finally did go. <laughs> the Lord had another plan. But while I, the, even the first couple of years I, I was there, I was in the, the prayer school and the healing school every day. And then later on, I was involved in the healing school, uh, counseling with people and praying for people and then eventually teaching and doing other things. And at one point they sent 
some of the, that, that, that big old video stuff before there was, uh, I'm not talking about VCR, I'm talking about pre-VCR. I mean, the cassettes were like that big. Boy, they were huge. And I had to take this giant player and this thing home with me to monitor it, monitor it for some things the ministry was doing with what Brother Hagin had taught. And so here, you know, five, six, seven years later, I'm, I'm watching and hearing him teach on some things about the faith and healing. And I remember one day I was, I was watching it and listening to that, and I thought, glory to God. Now, I never heard him say that. I never, that's life changing. And I thought, where was I? I mean, did, did I miss that day? And in a few minutes, the camera panned, and there I was on the front row. I thought, no. I, I never heard that. I was there. Can you hear and not hear? Yes. And see, it's not just that, though. It's I had grown. Yes. I had grown. You see, Jesus said, take heed how you hear. So even though people, the, the same sound waves are bouncing off of everybody's ears the same, still not everybody's hearing the same. And that, that means a lot of things. Didn't Jesus say more than once, him that has ears to hear? And you see that in the book of Revelation, him that has ears to hear. Well, he's not talking about that you got a, a, a ear on the side of your head and an and eardrum and all that. He, you, do you have an ear that's inclined to hear it? Are you tuned on the same frequency? Do you have a heart to hear it? Do you value it? Do you want it? So, uh, uh, just like you've eaten potatoes more than once, you need to hear the same word more than once because actually you'll hear things you didn't hear before. You've grown. You've developed. That's true with everybody. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, notice this. He said all these things, and he just got through mentioning different things that had happened with God's uh, first covenant people that he brought out of Egyptian bondage different things that had happened with them. He said, these things happened to them for in samples. Now, we probably would, wouldn't say that today. We'd say examples. Examples. They happened to them for examples. Examples of what? They are written for our admonition. The things that happened to them that are recorded in the Old Testament, how God delivered them out of Egyptian bondage through all those signs and wonders, how he brought them through the Red Sea, how he brought them to the mount and gave the Ten Commandments and, and how they wandered around out there for 40 years and then finally the next generation did have the courage and faith to go in and possess the promised land. All of that is typical for you and me. It applies to us now. Many have not seen that or believed it. And so you have a lot of folks neglect their Old Testament, thinking it's not applicable. No, there, there are tremendous examples for us right now. Everything that happened to them was a type and an example that finds its fulfillment in Christ. These things happened for examples. They're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Uh, let me read two other translations. The easy to read says, the things that happened to those people are examples. They were written to be warnings for us. We live in the time that all those past histories were pointing to. Weymouth says, all this kept happening to them with a figurative meaning, but it was put on record by way of admonition to us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. What are we to learn about what happened to them? The list is, is too long to get into one, one service. But we've been talking about this. And the, the, the last sessions that we begin to touch on, we mentioned three different levels of living that they experienced. They experienced life under Pharaoh in Egypt as a slave. They experienced life in the wilderness, didn't they? And then eventually, some of them experienced life as free men and women 
in Canaan's land. Hmm? Is, does that have anything to do with us? The Bible says all these things are types and examples for what are we to learn about it? Well, the same thing is true today. There are people of God that are living in Egypt as far as how they're living. There are people who are living in the wilderness. And there are a few who are going to Canaan's land. <laughs> are you interested in, in what it's like to live in Canaan's land? Anybody? That was four or five people. Romans 12 talks about this. Romans 12 too. They put it up on the screen for us. It says, be not conformed to this world. Don't take that lightly. None of us should take that lightly. Why would he tell you don't be conformed to this world? Because if you don't make an effort, you will be. You will be conformed and you will think like the world thinks. And you will talk like the world think, talks and you'll have what the world has. Don't be conformed to this world. Say it out loud. I'm not going to be conformed to the ungodly world around me. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. We're different. We live different. Hmm? Be ye transformed. And how do you get transformed? By the renewing of your mind, which is one of the reasons we come together like this. Right? It's one of the reasons we poke the holy cows. Right? Huh? <laughs> and kick over the, 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 the sacred traditions of men that got nothing to do with the Word of God. That are not sacred. And this is how it happens. Your mind has to be changed and renewed and that will keep you from being conformed to this world and in doing so when your mind gets renewed with the God's thoughts his words his ways then you can discern and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God why would he use all these words to describe it I believe one reason is that people are living in different degrees of the will of God. Some people are completely out of the will of God. Others are living in some of the will of God. Others are living in more of the will of God. Oh, but some can and are living in the perfect will of God. What's the perfect will of God? What does it look like? What does it sound like? You know what it looks like? It looks like Canaan's land. <laughs> That's the perfect will of God. Was Egypt the perfect will of God for God's people? It was not. It was not. Was the wilderness the perfect will of God for God's people? It was not. Canaan's land was always God's perfect will. But that whole generation, I mean, uh, there went on for 400 years of people living in Egypt. God's people. And then when he finally did get them out of there, the first generation refused to go into Canaan's land. They weren't supposed to stay out there in the wilderness for 40 years or 30 years or 20 years. They were supposed to make a, a, a brief trip through there and learn some valuable faith lessons and how to believe God and how to trust God and obey God and go into Canaan's land Amen. and live the remainder of their life as free, prosperous people. Yes. Do you believe it? Yes. Was the will of God, is the will of God. God doesn't change. What's his will for us now? Hmm? Egyptian living, no. wilderness living, no. or living in Canaan's land. Canaan's land. <laughs> Canaan land living. It's what I'm going for. Right. How about you? Yeah. We'd have to find out what it is, wouldn't we? Reckon we're there already? 
<laughs> getting looks all across the crowd. <laughs> Let's talk about these, these different levels of living a little, bit, a little bit longer. What is living in Egypt? We know all these things are types and examples for us today. What's living in Egypt a type of? When they lived in Egypt for those four centuries... Four centuries and 30 years, 430 years. When they lived there, they lived a life of not enough, didn't they? Not enough. And when you don't have any resources, they had no legal rights. They had no civil rights. They had no rights at all. They were the property of the Egyptians. Just like a, a horse or a cow. They didn't own the rags on their back. They didn't own the, the shack they stayed in. They were powerless. They had no freedom. They had no ability. Is that God's will for his people? No. Absolutely not. Amen. See. Poverty is really about control. The enemy is always trying to control things down here. And sadly, he's been far too successful at it. And people who don't know God, not saved, they're going to be controlled. Oh, they like to think they're doing their own thing, but they're not. They're being influenced. They're being manipulated. Do you believe it? Yeah. They're not free. They're not free. And sadly, many people of God are not free either. Sickness is about control. Mental oppression is about control. If the devil can keep you sick enough and confused and depressed enough and broke enough, it's like being in a jail cell. You can't do anything, no matter what, you, you don't have any vision. If, if, sometimes it's where people give up because they think, well, I, I don't have any money. I'm never going to have anything anyway to be able to do anything. Why do I, what am I going to dream about and have a vision about? Just disappoint myself, set myself up to be disappointed. It's all about control. And when they were living in Egypt, they had no control and they had no freedom and no ability somebody say not the will of God, not will of God. certainly not for his people right certainly not for his people and when God brought them out of Egyptian bondage and it took multiple signs and wonders to do it didn't it I mean Pharaoh was not going to let them go not no how no way He's not going to let them go now, tomorrow, or next year, or next century. They've been there four centuries. He's not about to let them go. They're the backbone of the economy. And so they had to let them go. The, the nation was brought to its knees, right? And it's their fault that they drug it out so long and made it go so far. They could have said yes the first day. They could have said, great, have fun, <laughs> and been spared from all that loss and judgment. Couldn't they? Sure they could have been. But uh, when they came out, the Bible said in Psalms, the Lord brought them out with silver and with gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. They were free, they were healed, and they had money. Are you looking at the will of God? Are you hearing the will of God? Silver and gold. And healed. Not one feeble person among their tribes. And after four centuries, their, their dad and mom wasn't free. Their grandparents weren't free. Their great grandparents were, weren't free. But they are. Amen. They are. Yeah. By the mighty hand of God. Yeah. Set free. Yeah. And they came up out of Egypt. Hallelujah. And they, they quit living in Egypt. They quit living that way. 
And they came, God brought them across the Red Sea and, you know, brought them to the mount and gave them uh, his will and his laws. And they, they've been hearing ever since Moses showed up. He told them that he was bringing them into a land that flowed with milk and honey. The very, the very beginning of the book of Exodus, Exodus 3. He said, I'm taking you out of here. I'm taking you to a land that flows with milk and honey. Lord. What does that mean? What does the phrase flows with milk and honey mean? Everything hmm? This ain't rake by, scrape by, get by. Is it? Hmm? No. The land, what, what did God intend for this to put in these people's minds when he tells them, I'm taking you out of here and I found a place for you and it's a good place. It's a rich place. It's a place that flows with milk and honey. Got so many cows. You got milk and butter and ice cream everywhere. Right? <laughs> you got so many bees. You got honey. Right? You got to remember, this is before the development of, of sugar, uh, refined sugar and corn syrup and all this kind of stuff. If you wanted something sweet, honey was it, brother. That was it. You wanted something, you know, uh, better than just water to drink, ice cold milk. And some fresh honey. Huh? And some fresh fruit. And vegetables. Still the best stuff you can get. Right? <laughs> right? Man-made stuff is not an improvement. And he's telling them that this, uh, this place I'm taking you to, it just flows with it. It just flows with it. Now in order to get there, they got to live in the wilderness for a little while just to get there. And that was the plan of God. It, it was his plan all along for them to come through the wilderness and learn some valuable lessons. So let's, let's come up out of Egypt, not enough living, into the wilderness. How many believe that's a step up? Is that a step up? That's a big step up. Huge step. You're free. You healed and you got money. Yeah. Right? right? Sure beats being a slave. Yeah. Right? Sure beats being broke and sick. Yeah. Right. No question about it. They came up. And out in the wilderness, how did they live? They lived day to day. He told them, don't save up the manna day to day, didn't he? They had supernatural provision. There was water out of the rock. There was manna falling from heaven every day. There were times when he flew quail in, fresh quail, without an airplane. God can do it, can he? <laughs> but they're living day to day. Does that sound familiar? They're living day to day, week to week. Sounds like check to check. <laughs> hmm? And it's written in this text there. It's also written in Corinthians that he that gathered much didn't have anything over. He that gathered little didn't lack. So they all had what? Just enough. Is that a big step to come up from not enough to just enough? It, it's such a huge step, you might think you had arrived. Huh? To go from never having enough to every day having enough is such a big step up. You could think, man, we're having supernatural uh, provision. We're having God meet our needs, Right? Day after day, we're not running out. We're, we're, we're not coming behind. You could think we're in the perfect will of God. But were they? No. I said, were they? No. no. Why are we talking about this tonight? Because what happened to them 
is an example for us. It's a type for us. It applies to us, the New Testament says. Reckon how many people of God are living just enough. Hmm? Day to day. Week to week. Check to check. Hmm? I wonder how many. See, what do you think those guys after living that way for 20 years? 30 years? 40 years? You get used to it. Don't you? You get used to it and you think, well, glory to God. God's meeting my needs. He is. I mean, we're having spectacular provision. We're having miracles of provision. They were. Manna falling out of the sky. But it wasn't God's best. It wasn't his highest and best. It wasn't his, wasn't his ultimate plan. Sure beats Egypt. But it's not Canaan's land. Is it? Living in the land of just enough. Now, anybody can be satisfied living there. It's, it's not all up to God. That was part of the problem. In order to get into Canaan's land, it's going to take some courage, wasn't it? It was going to take coming over some walls. It was going to take facing some giants. And it's easier just to keep living check to check. Isn't it? Sure. God's meeting our needs. We're paying our bills. Don't have anything over. The time we get through paying everything, we, there's nothing left. But uh, glory to God. God's meeting our needs. <laughs> no, this is not good enough. Because if this is all we ever live at, how do we help others? How do we finance the gospel? The, the kingdom, extend the kingdom around the world. How? How? And this is where millions are. Just enough. Somebody say just enough. What was God's, God's will? Hmm? Canaan's land. What was Canaan's land? What was, anybody want to know what Canaan's land is? Hmm? You know, you know the, the phrase, it's more than enough. But go with me, I'm, I want you to read some scriptures. I want you to read more than one. I want us to get excited about Canaan's land. <laughs> is it in the Bible? Yes. Why is it here? It's not just here a time or two or three or ten or twenty. There's a lot said about Canaan's land. Why? It's a type of something for us. A type of what? An example of what? In Numbers, the 13th chapter, let's let the Word tell us what Canaan's land is. Numbers 13, when they went and spied out the land, and the, the 12 spies bring back the report. Verse 25, Numbers 13, 25, they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Keep going. They went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel to the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh. They brought back word to them and all the congregation, and they showed them those great big bunches of grapes. And all the fruit of the land. And uh, they told him, they said, we came to the land which you sent us and surely it flows with milk and honey. They've been, they, they hadn't seen it until now. They had just heard it. But how many of you can trust God? If God tells you, this thing flows with milk and honey. This, this is so rich. This is, this is a virtual paradise, if you will. And it does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Here's the proof of it. We saw it, and here's an example of it. This is not just the only one like it. There were lots of grape clusters over there like this. This is an example of one. And the people were going, whoa, I never saw a cluster of grapes like that. And it's proof that God's word is true. That if he tells you, you can count on it. Verse 28. Nevertheless, but, oh yeah, it's a great land, all right. 
full of grapes and pears and peaches and such. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's off the chart. Yeah, yeah, it is. But, 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 we got giants over there. And we got walled cities. Keep going. They described all the ones that were there. You know the story. They got upset and everybody started crying. Verse 32. They brought up an evil report of the land. Which they had searched to the children of Israel. They said the land which we have gone to search it. It's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are a men of great stature. So they changed the title of the land. From the land that flows with milk and honey to the land that will eat you up. And God said it was evil. Their designation of it is evil. Because when he calls it good, you don't call it bad. Right? And they did. Now, now why are we talking about this? Just to talk about how badly they messed up. This applies to us, right? We, we're to be warned and we're to be instructed that we don't do what they did. Is there a land available to us? Yes. A land that flows with milk and honey? Yes. A good land? Yes. Is it just going to fall on us? No. no. We're going to have to gird up our loins like men, right? We're going to have to use our faith. We're going to have to not be moved by what we see and don't see and feel and don't feel. Hmm? Make up our mind. If the Lord bought it and paid for it, I'm going to have it. If it takes a year, if it takes ten. Right? We're not in this trying it out. We're in this for the long haul. It's either true or it's not. We're not going to let what we see and feel convince us, oh man, you don't want to get into that. You want to play it safe back over here. In fact, let's go back to Egypt. Is that what they did? It's exactly what they did. They cried in their tents. I won't take the time to read all of it, but right here in this 13th chapter. You read this 13th and 14th chapter of Numbers. They cried and they got mad and they got upset. They got so mad they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. Because they stood up and brazenly said, it's a good land. God's for us. Let's go get it. We can take it. We can get it. The, The enemy, they're bred for us. Their defense, it made, them, it made those, those folks so mad they wanted to kill Joshua and Caleb for saying that. Why? Because faith makes unbelief mad. You'll experience that too. You get in a whole lot of faith. Not everybody will be glad about you being in faith. And they'll tell you that you need to calm down. <laughs> and live in the real world. <laughs> and the real world they're talking about is Egypt. The land of not enough. And I say, no. I'm not going to live in Egypt. I'm not going to live perpetually in the land of not enough and no control and no ability. If you don't have any ability, do you know what your options are? You, you got no freedom, you got no power, you got no money, you got no ability. If you want to do something and you got no power or freedom or ability, what's your options? You either, number one, don't do it, never do it, or number two, what's the other option? You have to go to somebody that has it. And see if you can get them to help you or let you. You're dependent on them. Is that true or not? Of course, we know there's an option three. Anybody know about option three? What's option three? Leave. (laughs) Leave Egypt. (laughs) And don't stay in the wilderness either. Don't live there. Don't live like that. And don't say, well, yeah, but you don't understand. I'm from so-and-so, and, 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 and I'm, I'm young, or I'm old, or, 
or I'm, I'm, I'm a woman, or, or I'm, I'm a man, or I'm not the right color, or I'm not the right education. Or if you're going to make excuses, you're going to stay stuck right where you are, and you can never live anywhere else. In Christ, there is no male, and there's no female. There is no age. In Him, you are more than a conqueror. Do you believe it or not? More than a conqueror. You are an overcomer. And that's what it takes to get into Canaan's land. You got to be more than a conqueror. You got to be an overcomer. You can't be a cry in your tent. Little whiny baby. Want to go back to Egypt. You got to be Joshua. You got to be Caleb. You got to strap on your gear and put your boots on and say, let's go get her. Let's go take that mountain. Now, now, what are we talking about? Does this have practical application for us? Yeah. It does. We're talking about a way of living, a level of living, and a way of living. What is wilderness living? Help me out again. Day to day, month to month. Check. Not, uh, you got enough, but you don't have anything over. You're paying your bills, but you got nothing left. Hmm? And even God's, God's doing it supernaturally. It's God. But it's not his highest and best. Is it? Sure beats Egypt. But Canaan's land, what, what is it? Go to, the, go to number 16. He describes Canaan's land. <laughs> I'm not just uh, preaching I believe this is the, the, the will of God. I believe this is the word of the Lord. Do you? I believe it has direct practical application to you and me now in this year where we live and move and operate. Do you believe it? Number 16. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and other guys rose up against Moses. And spoke against him and basically said, who do you think you are? And who put you in charge? Hmm? Anybody know the answer to that question? Who put you in charge? Who put him in charge? God picked him on the backside of the desert, didn't he? He picked him. He put him in charge. Now, you know, it's really, it shows how dull they were. You really have to ask after seeing all those miracles in Egypt, after crossing the Red Sea, after all that stuff, you have to ask, who put you in charge? So ignorant, isn't it? But the more unthankful you get and the more unbelieving and fearful you get, you get dumbed down. You get blind, blinded. Your understanding gets darkened. I'm quoting scriptures. Now, verse... Uh, 13, number 16, he called them and said, come talk to me, guys. And they said, we're not going to do it. So rebellious. Does anybody know what happens to these guys just a few verses later? The ground <laughs> opens up and they all go into the, to it alive and all their cows and dogs and cats, everything. And, and the ground closed up and basically God said, that's what I think about that. Rebellion is, is a, as devilish as it gets. It's what the devil did, right? And he keeps trying to breathe it into human beings. He's been far too successful. Make up your mind that you are not going to be rebellious. Are y'all listening, saints? Say it out loud, I refuse, I refuse to, be to be rebellious. It's the same thing as saying I refuse to be devilish. I refuse to be like the devil. So that's what they were doing. And so then they get smart with him. And they say, is it a small thing that you brought us up uh, out of a land that flows with milk and honey? Now, now let's stop right there. <laughs> what are they talking about? Egypt. Egypt. <laughs> They're calling Egypt the land that flows with milk and honey. Why would they say that? 
because it is the best thing they've ever experienced. They did have gardens and crops in Egypt, and they didn't in the wilderness. Are y'all with me? Never mind, they were slaves (laughs) and got beatings regularly. Huh? But see, all you know is what you know. And that ain't much. All you know is what you've experienced and where you've been. And that ain't much. When God calls you out and he calls you up to better, it requires the turning loose of what you know. And the leaving of what you've become comfortable with. What you know. What's familiar. Comfortable. Hmm? Isn't it something that a people could become comfortable in slavery? No, not completely comfortable, certainly. But enough to want to go back into it. There's any number of, of cases of people who spent a lot of time in prison and were so uncomfortable being free and being out, they committed a crime so they could get back in. It's happened lots of times. Why? Because it takes faith to face the unknown, doesn't it? It takes faith to leave your comfort zone. Doesn't it? You got to believe that God would not lead you astray. You got to believe if he tells you, I got something better for you, then it is. Right? You got to believe that even if some time passes, some, some weeks pass and some months pass and even some years pass and all you see is dust and hot and uncomfortable wilderness. You got to hold your faith That what God told you is true. And never even let yourself look back. Remember what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? When she looked back, she never went forward another step. She, She never would go forward another step. How many know you cannot go forward looking back? You you can't. Phyllis and I have, have done this more than once now in our 30 plus years of ministry. We left our home, our little stuff in Mississippi. I know it don't sound like a whole lot now, but it was everything we had. And then we built and, and, and believed God for decades in Tulsa. And the Lord dealt with us, turn loose and, and go here. And it's, it's like starting over. And, and there are parts of you that wants to, and in fact, when the Lord's dealing with us to leave Tulsa and go to Branson, And at that time, I didn't know we're starting to work, but I just knew that the resources weren't there that we had where we were, and I didn't know anybody, and basically we're starting over in some ways. And uh, I remember I had went a few days, and it was, uh, you know, I'm thinking about it, and um, I'm not just rejoicing and shouting. (laughs) I'm looking at this. We, you know, we, we had finally, after 20 years, we had got the kind of house we wanted. And Phyllis had just got through remodeling her kitchen. She had always wanted a kitchen with all the stainless stuff and all that stuff. Somebody walked up to her and handed her an envelope with money to remodel her her kitchen with. Just got done with it. So now we're going to leave. I had just got, we had just got our hangar on the airport. I was 10 minutes from it. You know, I mean, in in less than an hour, I could be in the air headed somewhere for a meeting. And where we were, uh, the runway's not half as long as it needs to be, and it's got a cliff on both ends, and and no hangar available. And and then you, we actually had to drive an hour one way just to get to a decent airport for a, a long time. Thank God they built us an airport right there in Branson. Yeah. I know they built it for other people, but I felt like it was just for us. So thankful. So thankful. But during that time, 
I was, I remember I was shaving one morning, getting ready to go, and, and uh, I'm pondering these things, and the Lord spoke to me. I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me, like he will to any Christian, any believer, if you listen to him. He said, uh, Keith, do you believe I'm able to do better for you than this? And I, I, I hadn't clarified it, but when he said that to me, I saw it. I'm hesitating to turn loose what we've got. And to go to what? To go to where? <laughs> you know, you don't know. Hadn't seen it yet. And uh, I laid my, my razor down. I said, yes, sir, I do. I do. I'm sorry for, for entertaining anything else. I absolutely do believe. You've done it already. You've done it more than once. I do believe. You're well able. Isn't that what our scriptures say? Able to make all grace abound toward us. I didn't say all that. That's what the verse is. I, I, I'm convinced you're well able to do better for us than what we have here. When I said it immediately like this, he said, I'm going to give you the best of Branson. <laughs> and he did. I said he did. He did in every way. Oh, somebody say glory to God. But at every, at every juncture... At every, every step and phase, you have to turn loose of the known and the familiar. And you've got to be willing to uh, uh, endure and not be moved by what you see. And things don't just happen overnight, now do they? No. Everything doesn't just come to pass in a month or two or three or a year. And if you don't obey and trust God, it takes longer than it should. The longer you drag your feet, the more stubborn you are, the more you won't listen. Instead of it taking three months, it can take 40 years. And in some cases, never happen. Not because it wasn't the will of God, but because folks wouldn't listen. There's no social promotion. In God's things. You either pass the test. Or you don't. If you don't pass the test. Guess what? You get to take it again. <laughs> and if you flunk it for 10 years. Guess what? You get to take it again. And again. And again. And that's where people get discouraged. And they go God. What's the problem? You told me you had a land that flow with milk and honey for me. It's still true. The problem's not with him. <laughs> Selah. They said, the Living Bible said, number 16, 13, is it a small thing they mimicked? See, smart aleck. You might know what smart aleck is. Yeah. Yeah. That you brought us out of lovely Egypt. Oh, lovely Egypt. The land that flows with milk and honey. They're calling Egypt. <laughs> Where they were treated like animals. They want to go back. Now, can you see this was happening from the time God got them out of there? You remember they built that golden calf and said these are your gods and, and let's get somebody to lead us back. I always want to go back. I always want to go back. They're in the best shape they've ever been in. Right now. And I know it's dry and dusty and you're not seeing the, the milk and honey but it's there. It's, it's right over there. And all you got to do is pass some tests and you'll get there. But rather than do that what'd they say? No. Milk and honey is where we come from. If I could just get back to the good old days. <laughs> back when you made a dollar an hour. Worked 14 hour days. Good old days. Hmm? People are so romantic about stuff. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how they're Memories get twisted. 
How many believe the child of God that's following the Lord has absolutely no reason to look back? Be thankful for everything God did for you. But where is your best stuff? Where is your best days? Your best? It's in front of you. It's up ahead. Is it a small thing? They said you brought us out of lovely Egypt to kill us here in this terrible wilderness. And now you want to make yourself our king. Verse 14. What's more, you haven't brought us into the wonderful country you promised, nor given us fields and vineyards. Who are you trying to fool? We refuse to come. This is how people talk before they die in the wilderness. Smart mouthed, disrespectful. See, they didn't realize that they're not just mouthing it at Moses. He, he told them what the Lord told them. Right? The Lord took these things personally. It angered him. They, they, they slandered his beautiful land he chose from. They claimed Egypt is better than what he's got for them. They judged themselves unworthy of it, didn't they? Even though it was God's will all the time. The complete English version says it like this. CEV verse 12, verse 12. Moses sent for Dathan and Abiram, but they sent back this message. We won't come. It's bad enough you took uh, us from our rich farmland in Egypt. <laughs> How about you didn't own any of it and never would to, to let us die here in the desert. Now you also want to boss us around. You keep promising us rich farmlands with fertile fields and vineyards, but where are they? We've been out here, dust, wilderness, manna. How many of you remember they despised the manna? We're sick of this manna. Never mind you'd have starved to death long ago if you hadn't had it. Oh, friends, is everybody awake? Yes. Whose fault is it that they're still out here? Their fault. They could have already been over there. <laughs> but they want to leave the land of just enough and go back to the land of not enough. Don't they? Somebody say dumb, dumb, dumb. Not smart. Go to Deuteronomy 6. How about less saying, not us? Not us. I don't want to go back. Somebody needs to say it out loud. I don't want to go back. I'm not going back. How about this next part? I'm not staying where I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful for where God has brought me from. I am. And man, just enough is a mountain above. Not enough. But God's got something even greater, even better, even better than always having your needs met. God's got something even better than always having your bills paid. Somebody, is somebody hearing this? He's got something even better. What is it? More than enough. Surplus. All your stuff Paid, paid off. Come on, are you listening to me? And ability, freedom, control. <laughs> when you can have your own, you can run it the way the Lord leads you. Not the way some unbelieving owner tells you you have to. When you got your own, you don't have to ask people, can you? Hmm? That's right. When you got your own ability, your own money, your own stuff, your own buildings, your own vehicles, your own equipment, yes. yeah. you're free. Yes. I said you're free yes. and you have ability. Free, not just to do your own thing, free to do what he tells you to do. Yes. What the Lord tells you to do. Lord. Do you want that kind of freedom, yes. that kind of ability? Yes. 
The Lord speak to you. You get up one morning. You're not working three jobs because you don't need to. Huh? Instead of working nine days a week, you work three half days. <laughs> Come on, are y'all listening or not? And you're making ten times what you used to. Working all week. Hmm? So you can get up in the morning. And instead of rushing with the traffic, you can pray for two hours. And the Lord show you and tell you, so-and-so is having a rough time. And they need some help and they need some encouragement. I want you to go over there and I want you to pay off those bills for them. And I want you to encourage them for three days. And you can. You can. You got the health. You got the strength. You got the freedom. You got the time. You got the money. You got the stuff. Come on, are y'all listening to me saying? Do you desire this at all? You can't do that living in Egypt. You can't go anywhere except where the unbelieving boss says you can go. Right? Even if you wanted to, you got nothing to do it with. You can't do it in the wilderness. Because you got enough to pay your bills, but you got nothing else. You got nothing more. What's Canaan land? Deuteronomy 6, 1. What's Canaan land? Deuteronomy 6, 1. You got not enough. And then there's a big step up. Whew, just enough. It's a great place compared to not enough. But there's another place. There's another place. Another place called Canaan's land. More than enough. What does that land look like, sound like, feel like? The Lord said, these are the commandments and statutes and the judgment which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it. Keep reading. That you might fear the Lord your God and keep all the statutes and commandments which I command you and your son, your son's sons, all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. A big part of your wealth is your time. Time you can call your own and years of life. Hmm? The Lord will satisfy you a long life. Prolonged days. Keep going. Hear therefore Israel, observe that you may, it may be well with you, that you may increase mightily as the Lord God your fathers has promised you in the land that flows with milk and honey. What do you do in the land that flows with milk and honey? You increase mightily. Keep going. He goes on to say, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And he says tremendous things. Let's skip down to verse 7. Well, excuse me. I'm, I'm moving too fast. I'm looking at the clock. But you need to hear these verses too, don't you? Back up, back up. The Lord our God is one Lord. Keep going. You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Is he describing how to get to Canaan's land here? He is. Keep going. These words which I command you this day, they'll be in your heart. Keep going. And you'll teach them diligently to your children. You'll talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You know, Phyllis and I were talking about this. We've, we've been observing more of a Sabbath in our week. Now, don't make me say more than I said. Don't get legalistic about the Sabbath. But the Lord decreed a day of rest, Amen. didn't he? And the Lord's been dealing with me that uh, we live in a generation that never rests. That includes everybody, kids, retired folks, everybody. Why? Because what is rest? You know, even the day when you're not having to work at the job, People sometimes, they, 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 they're traveling, they're working, they're doing all these hobbies, they're doing all this stuff. When is, when's the last time 
You rested all day. You didn't do any business or play. All you did was rest and be still and know that he was God. People are not doing that, are they? And it's taking a toll on folks, too. I said it's taking a toll on people. They're scattered. They don't have peace like they need to. There's not clarity. And you can see this, that in connection with this, time is prosperity. That you got time, you don't have to do other things, making a living, trying to do this, just, just getting the, uh, keeping the bare essentials and necessities. You got time. You can just wait on him. You can do what he tells you to do. That's being rich. Come on, can you see that, saints? That's being rich. You got options. You can do what he directs you to do. Keep going. You teach them to your children. The reason I got into this is because folks are so busy. They're up. They're out of the house. They're scattered. They're, they're, they're six ways. They come back. They're doing something till midnight and they just, uh, you know, pass out and jump up the next morning and hit it again. There's no, uh, there's no time where we're just talking about the things of God. There's no rush there's peace. There's not a bunch of junk and loud noises going on. We live in a media age, but it's not all good. Amen. All these sounds and noises and voices going all the time. Talk about them. Talk to your kids about them. When you get up, when you, when you walk, when you lay down, when you get up, what are you talking about? The things of God. The words of the Lord, what He said. His ways. Keep going. Skip down to verse 10, actually, for time's sake. It'll be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give you great and goodly cities which you didn't build. Amen. What's Canaan's land? More than More than huh? Canaan's land is getting whole developments that you didn't build. Now they're yours. Somebody else built them. Somebody else invested all the capital, all the work, all the sweat, all the time, and God just gave them to you. Now they're yours. That's Canaan's land. Very different from Egypt. Very different from the wilderness. Keep reading, keep reading. And what? How's it? Anybody awake in here tonight? Houses, huh? Full, full of good things. Actually, that's that word again, goods, not bads. <laughs> Houses full of goods, good things, which what? You didn't feel. You didn't feel. Wells dig. And this part of the country, and any part of the country, basically, especially in arid places, man, this is worth more than gold. You got a good deep well that don't run dry? You're rich, man. Wells digged. That what? You didn't dig. Well, how did it happen? You wound up with it. You didn't dig it. <laughs> the Lord worked it out for you. Right? Vineyards, olive trees, which what? You didn't plant plant them, which means you don't have to wait till they grow up and produce fruit. (laughs) Glory to God, which you didn't plant. Does this sound at all like Matthew 6.33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what would happen? Not you will spend all your strength in every waking hour working, 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 trying to get this, trying to get that, trying to get ahead a little bit. No, that's, that's not the Canaan's land way. That's something else. Houses full of good things. 
Does this word mean anything to us tonight? Does it belong to us? The blessing of Abraham is ours. Right? Everything that happened to them happened as a type and as an example. So you might have thought I just pulled something off the top of my head or blue when we're talking about, you know, uh, we're getting our houses and our buildings and our lands. And what we keep saying is this is not just about accumulating a ton of stuff. This has to do with the plan of God. It is. Houses full of good things which you filled up. You didn't work and scrape for 20 years and save your pennies so you could finally get your place and put your little whatnots in there. <laughs> you were busy obeying God, doing what He told you to do, and the next thing you know, He said, go over here, do this, go over there, that's yours, I'm going to give this to you. Next thing you know, you just bought your little bags and moved in. And it was already there. You just started enjoying it. That's already happened to Phyllis and I more than once. It's already happened to us more than once. God's a good God. Do you believe He's a good God? There's different ways of living. I saw a bumper sticker on a guy's car one time and reason I quote it because it's representative of so many folks. It said, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> what kind of living is that? It's honorable to work. Hmm? Isn't it? To be willing to work and to work is honorable. But there's people work hard all their life and never have anything to show for it. That's not right. That's not the plan of God. That's not the way. There's another way. Oh, it involves work, but it's not just working for yourself, it's working for Him. Hmm? You're not just going to sit around and goof off and do nothing. Yeah, you, you, it's going to take faith. You're going to have to go after it. But while you're seeking Him, He'll add it to you. He'll add it to you. Houses full of good things. Which you filled not wells digged, you didn't dig vineyards, olive trees, you didn't plant. He said, but now watch out when you've eaten and you're full. Beware lest you forget the Lord which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. Don't do it. Verse 23, what did it say? He brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our fathers. Why did he bring them out of Egypt? Not to stay in the wilderness. He brought them out of there so he could bring them into Canaan's land. Always his plan. Always his will. Go to the uh, 11th chapter of Deuteronomy. I'm trying to close. Deuteronomy 11. Verse 7. He said, your eyes have seen all the great acts which the Lord did. Keep going. You'll keep all his commandments so you can be strong. Go in and possess the land, whether you go to possess it. Keep going. That you may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord swear your fathers to give to them their seed. A land that what? Flows with milk and honey. Thank you, Lord. Keep going. The land you go to possess it, it's not like the land of Egypt that you came out of. Somebody said out loud, it's not like that. What does that mean? It's different. He said, you sowed your seed and you watered it with your foot as a garden of herbs. Nothing grew unless you watered it. Double work. I mean, you had to water, water, break up the ground, and plant the seed, and, and then water, water, and then you had to weed it and water it, and, and then get the crop in, you had to water it. He said, verse 11, but the land where you go to possess it, it's a land of hills and valleys, and it drinks water of the rain of heaven. He said, I water it. I take care of it. Ooh, somebody say, thank you, Lord. Keep going. A land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Keep going. 
It'll come to pass if you'll diligently hearken, uh, hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. I'll give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, the rain that gets the crop started and the rain that finishes it up. And you may gather in your corn and your wine and your oil. I'll send grass in your fields for your cows that you may eat and be full. Keep going. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. Don't turn aside, serve other gods and worship them. Keep going. Then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and the rain be shut off. Skip down to about verse 21 for time's sake. He said that your days may be multiplied and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear to your fathers to give them as what? Days of heaven upon the earth. That's what Canaan land living is, is a taste of heaven on earth. Do you believe it or not? I skipped a verse I shouldn't have skipped. Y'all tell me to quit rushing so much. Back up to 18. Back up to 18. He said, uh, let's see, the last one we read was 17 or 18? 17. 18. You lay up these words in your heart, verse 19. You'll teach them to your children when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lay down, same thing. When you rise up and what else? You'll write them on the doorpost of your house. And then you'll experience these days of heaven on the earth. Did, did, I, did I read uh, the eighth chapter? Did we? Huh? Back up, back up. Elsewise, we won't, we won't have covered this adequately. Eight and one. You, you observe these commandments, you're going to multiply. You're going to go in, you're going to possess the land. Keep going. Remember all these words. And see, they, he describes to them how that they learned, they should have learned, lessons out there in the wilderness. They should have humbled themselves. They should have learned trust. They should have learned faith. And he gets on to describing what this promised land is going to be. For the same thing we've heard over and over. The land that flows with milk and honey. Uh, he says in verse uh, 13. When your herds and your flocks multiply. And your silver and your gold is multiplied. And all that you have is multiplied. You're going to live, verse 12, and you're going to be full and you're going to have goodly houses and you're going to live in them. Somebody say amen. amen. And he said in verse 18, you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he that gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore unto your fathers as it is this day. Amen. How does this apply to us? All of it's a type for you and me today. Stand on your feet, everybody. Thank you, Lord. I want you to believe with me to pray a prayer right now for the reality of this to come into our spirit in a stronger way. That these are not just words from long ago. They are the living word of God to us tonight. And there's a season that you and I are in. And the Lord's been saying things to us about it. Time is short. His plan is big. Do you believe it? Yes. And who's he going to use? People just, There's a whole lot of people on the planet don't know him and don't care. He's not going to be using them. Hmm? What kind of people is he going to use? You looking at them. Me and you. Us. Do you believe it? Phyllis, would you come up, please? Just play softly for us. Come up. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Close your eyes. Sit out loud, Father God. I thank you 
for delivering me out of slavery. I was lost. I was blind. I didn't have my own soul. And you delivered me. You brought me out of bondage into liberty, out of darkness, into the kingdom of light of your dear son. Thank you for helping me to learn the lessons, to pass the tests, and not stay on a wilderness level of just enough my whole life, but to come on up, come on up, come on up to your perfect will, to Canaan's land. The land that flows with milk and honey. I believe it. By faith I see it. And I reach for it. And I thank you for bringing us in. Oh, hallelujah.